Great. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Hannu Rayanemi. I'm very, uh, very pleased to be here and very uh, glad to see so many of you. Uh, I, I, um, I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming um, you are here because you know at least uh, some of my work. So, so I guess I'm mainly known as the, uh, the author of the novels uh, the, the Quantum Thief and The, the Fractal Prince and the, the sort of forthcoming uh, Causal Angel. Uh, if you don't know, uh, know that, uh, I'm also a kind of recovering string theorist uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm trying, trying to get over it, honest, uh, keep, uh, keep falling back. Um, uh, also at the moment attending one of your uh, friendly neighbors, uh, the uh, Singularity University, doing some fun, fun things uh, with my teammates at the moment with, uh, with DNA. Um, can't say too much about that uh, at the moment. But um, what I sort of wanted to uh, talk about today um, with you uh, is the future of books. Obviously a subject uh, that I care about, it, care about very deeply. And I'll try to talk about it from, not necessarily from the point of view of e-books and e-publishing and things like that, but, but how could the form of the book itself change uh, as, as um, the, the way we, we create and read books changes. And, I'll, uh, if, and I think we have quite a, quite a bit of time, so, so um, I'll start with that, and then I'll also read uh, a short story which is kind of, kind of related to the, the themes that I'm going to talk about. So, and then also feel free to interrupt any time uh, with any questions, and we should have plenty of time for, for those later on as well. Um, so, um, I guess the first question is, where does one glimpse the, the future, uh, future of books? And the obvious answer is in a book. And specifically speaking, a book that begins like this. It was the day my grandmother exploded. Um, if you're not familiar with that book, it's, um, it's The Crow Road by, by, by Ian Banks. So, so the, the um, sadly, uh, recently uh, passed away um, after a short battle with cancer. Um, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it's one of my favorite books. And it's, it's certainly one of the, the great lines in, in, in all of literature. And um, I, I read it for the first time uh, back in 1998, so, so um, almost 15 years ago, back when I was still living in Finland, where I'm originally from. and. Um, and I, and, I, and I picked it up because, um, like probably many of you, I, I mainly knew Ian Banks as, as the author of the culture novels. So, so uh, these um, utopian uh, sp space operas set in, set in this society called The Culture, which is ruled over by Ray Kurzweil. Uh, so, sorry, uh, super, super, super intelligent uh, um, artificial minds. Um, but, um, but, but I happened to, so, 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 so I was drawn to this particular book by, by, um, by, by the author. But it actually turned out to be a very different novel from the culture book. So, so if, if you haven't read it, um, it's about a sort of young man's uh, attempts to, to deal with uh, his complicated family history and, and, and sort of uh, this sort of labyrinth of, of sex and death and, and, and uh, uh, the disappearance of, of his uh, eccentric uncle Rory who leaves behind this, uh, this mysterious manuscript uh, that he then sort of, uh, that then the main character Prentice uh, tries to piece together to figure out what happened to his uncle. Uh, as, as well as all, all kinds of weird and fun stuff related to his family history. So, so if you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend it. Um, but the reason I mentioned it was that it, it, it sort of really spoke to me when, when, when I read it, when I was in my, uh, it had to do obviously with the fact that the main character was also in his 20s in this kind of state of confusion trying to, trying to find, his, find his way, way in the world. Um, and and um, it also, uh, Banks is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, stylist and, and uh, writer of prose, so, so it also described Scotland, which for, for me at the time was kind of this strange, uh, almost science fictional landscape that, that sort of enhanced all the, all the sort of strange things, things happening in the story. Um, and and it, it was a very, it, it's, it, it is about death. The, the Crow Road is actually a Glaswegian expression uh, for, for, for death. To take the Crow Road means to die. Uh, and there's a lot of death in the book, but at its heart it's sort of 
tells you that, that things are going to be okay and, and uh, these difficult things can be, can be dealt with. Um, and then sort of a few months ago I, I, I happened to pick it up again, um, kind of motivated by, by the news uh, of uh, Ian Banks's illness. I wanted to kind of revisit some of his work and, and, I, and I read it again. And um, what really, really struck me um, was that what I read the second time felt like a totally different book, uh, like a completely different book. It, it sort of, um, first, first of all, the, the, the sort of simple aspect was that, that I, at that point I'd been living in Scotland for quite a while. So, so all the sort of evocative imagery um, that, that Banks has of about sort of ruined castles and, 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 and sort of clouds over highland, uh, highland islands and sunsets and things like that, I, I could really visualize them. They, they, I could smell the heather and, and sort of really be, be there much more powerfully than it could have been before. And I also finally got all the sex jokes. Uh, so there's quite a, quite a few, of them, few of them in there. Uh, and, and also the, the sort of uh, philosophy and attitude and of, of growth uh, felt, felt totally, totally different. So it was a very powerful experience to read it, read it again. Um, but what it made me really think about was that where was the book? What was the book? I, 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 I've always thought of books as, as these containers for sort of permanent eternal containers for the thoughts of the author. Uh, and and, and I, I guess there, there's a little, as a, as a writer, there's a little bit of wish fulfillment for, for some sort of authorial immortality that at least, uh, if, if, even if I'm mortal, some of my ideas will, will sort of uh, survive. But actually, it, it, if there wasn't, if, if, my, if, my, if my Crow Road 15 years ago was totally different from my Crow Road of, uh, of, of today, uh, where, where was the book? It, it sort of felt like uh, some sort of quantum mechanical observer dependent thing where, where sort of depending on how, me, uh, how I measure my quantum object, it sort of collapses, collapses into, into a different state. And, and then that really begged the question of what are books? Where, where, do, where do they come from and, and uh, uh, what is our relationship with them? And what is, what is bookness? And I think it's a very important question to ask today because we are in, in this era where books are becoming even more ephemeral, uh, quite literally sort of in, intangible, turning, turning into bits. I mean, something you guys are <laughs> extremely uh, well, well familiar with. Uh, so there is this process of dematerialization happening, happening with books. So, so what, what can we do with books uh, in, 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 in their sort of future intangible state? Can, will, are they going to disappear? Or are they going to become something completely different? So I started looking into what people were saying about, about the future of books. Um, and obviously, a lot of people have been thinking about this. And there's a lot of, a lot of research going on um, on the future of books. And um, one of the more interesting things I found was a um, scenario forecasting exercise by um, the design company IDEO, which um, We've sort of had some interactions with at Singularity University, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. And um, they, they came up with three quite interesting scenarios uh, named after sort of different, different uh, liter literary inspirations. So, so the first scenario they came up with was called uh, Copland. So uh, after, after Douglas Copland, the uh, author of Generation X and Microsurfs, and, and sort of anyone who's not familiar with Microsurfs, required reading for anybody who wants to get involved in a, in a startup. Um, and uh, the Copland scenario is, is uh, based on the idea that books are going to become more social and publishing is going to become more social. It's all going to be about who reads what in our social network, uh, what sort of recommendations are, are, are made, made uh, based on that, uh, uh, discussion around books and, and even things like, um, as part of the scenario, if a sufficient number of people in, in your social network buys a certain book, you will automatically get access to it as well. So, 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 so even the sort of business models around books in this scenario are going to be very socially driven. Um, the second scenario, uh, they, they called uh, Nelson, was, was uh, after Ted Nelson, sort of the, uh, the pioneer of, uh, of hypertext, um, was based on the idea that it's all about annotation and being able to, to refer uh, back to who is actually talking about your book? Who is quoting it? Um, what's, um, what, 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 is, how, what are the sources of the book? Can you, can, you, um, can you verify them? Can you generate more discussion around them? So 
about annotation and sort of bi-directional directional links. Um, so turning books into very different kinds of kinds of objects. And finally, which is maybe 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 the most uh, most obvious one or natural one, considering the growth of computer games, Alice uh, turning turning books into more game-like, sort of choose your own adventure style style things, or uh, with, with more media-rich content, and essentially merging them with with computer games. Um, obviously, these are not the only only possibilities. There's other uh, there are others like uh, Nick Montfort and Neil Gaiman who've recently uh, sort of created exercises where book-like things are authored collaboratively uh, using wiki-style systems. Um, so so you can see that sort of the role of People are thinking about how the role of the reader, the author, the, the, the sort of publishing industry, how, how, how that is going to change with technology. But uh, the more I, more I read about these things, the kind of more unsatisfying I, I, I found them, that there was something, something missing about, about all these scenarios. And it took me quite a while until I could really put my, put my finger on it. Um, but what I, what I started to feel was that, um, that the, really the core thing about, about um, my engagement with the Crow Road and any other book I've, I've read what was sort of the, the, the deep immersion, the sort of uh, kind of allowing yourself to be led into this sort of like waking dream where, where, where you spend a certain period of time. And maybe that dream is different um, at different times when you read the book, but there, there is this sort of real sense of letting go of your, your, yourself and sinking, sinking into the book, into, into a kind of dreamlike state. Um, so. Of course, that's something that neuroscientists uh, have, have studied. And, and um, uh, in 2009, there was a very interesting study by um, Nicole Spear at the University of Washington, where they, they actually looked at a lot of people reading in an fMRI machine and, and, and tried to understand what was going on in their brains as they were reading. And what, what they found was that uh, reading really is not a passive thing at all. I mean, it's it's not just consuming, taking information. It's actually um, virtually enacting the situations that you read about. So, so when you read about a certain action, you're, the same parts of your brain that would actually activate in real life if you were to carry out that action become engaged. So there's this mental simulation of virtual reality that we construct after reading reading a book. Um, and um, obviously, those, those simulations are shaped by our own experiences as well. But it's a very, very deep engagement. And it, it probably has to do with the fact that in order to read, we've, we've repurposed some very fundamental uh, pattern and symbol recognition machinery in our brains uh, that, that, that sort of really go, go to very primal layers. So, so, so actually, what books are from that point of view they're, they're, they're sort of information brain interface technologies. They're, you could almost call them brain computer interfaces in, in, in some, some way. And um, so, so then, can we, can we look, look at books from, from that point of view and what could we learn? Um, to, to take a step back uh, briefly, um, the um, books haven't always been this powerful. Um, and I'm trying to get to my next slide, which would show, show an example of that. Um, but um, there we go. So actually, books in their current form are a relatively recent thing. I mean, um, reading silently is a relatively new thing. Reading used to mean reading aloud. People, and and um, um, this is an example of sort of medieval script called scriptura continua, where there, there are no word spaces. And um, so... so, so in order to distinguish the different words and to make sense of the text, you would actually have to have to read it aloud very slowly and carefully. So, so it would, would, was very difficult to get this sort of immersion um, uh, state happening that I was talking about earlier. And it was only with technology, with, with sort of the printing press and, and typography and also kind of more software-like technology like, like grammar and sort of spelling conventions and, and, and things like that, that we actually managed to refine books into, into their, their, their current form. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the novel, which is kind of the current f highest form of fiction, if, if you like, or regarded as such, um, came around around the same time as the printing press started to, to become, become popular. So from this point of view, what, what, what could we do to, 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 go, to go further? 
So, so what would be the next step beyond what we have now if, if we start using technologies which are more powerful than just, just typography? Well, um, I think the, uh, the one part of the answer is something you, you um, guys at Google know a lot about, which is gathering information about the reader. So in, <laughs> in Soviet Russia, the book reads you. <laughs> and um, again, I don't have to tell you about all the technologies we now have to, to gather information about how we interact with a piece, piece of content. So, so um, uh, I'm sure you know all about my, my, my online reading, reading behavior, but now, now we also have uh, devices like this one. So, so it's an emotive uh, EEG uh, headset, uh, simple, simple commercial, commercial device that allows um, a user's brain activity to be uh, relatively sort of low fidelity, but still allows it to be recorded uh, while, wirelessly. What, what, while they're doing doing something, whatever whatever that is, and um, it, it, in case you follow these kinds of things, Emotive just uh, just a few days ago announced uh, sort of a next generation, much shinier, sort of uh, cyberpunkish, stylish uh, version of version of this device. Um, so so that's that's possible. Um, Samsung, I, I believe, is already experimenting experimenting with a thought control tablet. Um, another thing which is, which is relatively easy to do today is eye tracking, looking, looking at where a user's eyes move, move, move on the page. That's also a technology that's going to be probably integrated into, into tablets and mobile phones pretty soon. Um, I'm sure you can neither confirm nor deny anything about future incarnations of Google Glass, but it's not sort of um, beyond the boundaries of imagination to, to uh, assume that some, some form of either eye tracking or or sort of brain uh, interfaces or things like that could, could feature, feature there as well. And given that now increasingly the devices that um, have this power to, to gather this information are the same devices we use to read, um, then future books will literally have the power to read us. So, so what, the, what would those books be like? What, what could we do with this power? I mean, uh, as, uh, from, from the point of view of a writer, the interesting question is always, if you have a new technology, what, what sort of stories can you, can you tell with it? And it's uh, maybe a bit too early to say what's, what's possible, but there are a few interesting examples of things in this direction. So um, the BBC uh, has been experimenting with something called perceptive media. Um, a friend of mine there, uh, Ian Forrester at uh, BBC R&D, uh, produced a radio play called Breaking Out, where, where, which sort of adapts uh, the story a little bit based on what information uh, the, the app can gather about the user. It's very simple things, just uh, there are a few locations that, and, and, and sort of pubs and places like that that are mentioned in the story. And those are customized uh, for each user, given, given, given what can be ga information can be gathered about their location and interests. So uh, just, just in order to deliver sort of a more powerful emotional punch and a sort of a closer connection to, to, the, um, uh, to the story. Now, of course, you could be much more ambitious than that. Um, the, the sort of would we, would we if, if we, if we stay on the subject of actual books rather than other types of content, would we, could we imagine a book that sort of rewrites itself for every reader or perhaps for every, every reading? And uh, a good science fictional example of that, of course, is um, a young lady's illustrated primer uh, feature, this, this sort of um, personalized teaching device features in uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, the di novel The Night Diamond Age. Um, and in fact, um, there is a spin-out project from the One Laptop a Child project called Nell, uh, named after the, the protagonist of the Diamond Age, which is trying to do exactly that. So, so they, are, they are trying to create a system that can engage with a learning child by uh, generating these personalized, tailor-made fairy tales where the reader is the protagonist. Um, so, so, th so that's quite... That's quite uh, quite interesting. I mean, it's early days for, for that sort of thing, but, um, but it's, um, it's probably going to, going to happen sooner or later. So on a, on a, on a personal note, um, the, my friend Sam, uh, Sam Halliday, a, 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 uh, also a math recovering mathematician and a, and a data scientist, um, we, we wanted to do a little um, prototype of what we could imagine 
or very simple toy model of what we could imagine uh, a future book to be like. So, so, so um, this year we, we uh, created a project called Neurofiction, uh, which you can have a, have a look at online, which is essentially a story you read on a computer screen while, while wearing one of, one of these devices. And the story changes in response to your brain activity. So the idea was, idea was to, to not really make it a choose your own adventure story, um, but to, to retain this kind of linear immersive experience and just, just sort of have, give the user the same kind of experience that they, they have with traditional fiction. But underneath have the software and, and, and the, the, the interaction of, of, of their, their brains with the text drive the story. So, so the current, current story is called Snow White is Dead. It's, it's sort of a retelling of, of the fairy tale I'm sure you, you, you all know. And um, the way it works is that in the beginning of the story, we expose the user to some verbal imagery associated to first life and then death. And then for each subsequent scene, we measure the response to those scenes. So are they closer to life or death? And that sort of takes them down, um, I think, 48 possible, possible different paths with, with sort of two very different, different endings. Um, and we, we ran this uh, recently at the Edinburgh Science Festival and, uh, and, and it was, and got a lot of very, very positive feedback. So, so uh, I mean, obviously this was a very primitive experiment, but, but it seems possible to, to create narratives that really do, on some level, directly engage with a user's brain. And, and we've actually uh, open sourced all the, all the code that, that we wrote. So, so if you have an emotive device or, or, or hopefully we'll update it for the new emotive device, you can, uh, Download it and, and play with it and try to try to create your your own own neurofiction as well. Um, so, just to conclude, um, obviously it's hard to hard to predict the future. So so none of these technological innovations I've mentioned might might be might survive for very long or might be replaced by by something we can't yet imagine. But I do believe that book a book itself. Uh, and fiction are, are quite robust against change and there's a, there's a lot of them that we love that, that I think is worth preserving. Um, and, but, but I do like, very much like the idea of a book that is not just a receptacle for the thoughts of the author but also re, uh, preserves the experience of the reader in some way so that we through, through devices like the emotive or, or, or its future incarnations we get some sort of emotional marginalia preserved between the pages of the book. So, sort of like this quote from uh, Argentinian writer Alberto Manguel, which is, out, which is underlined here. Um, so, implicit in the possession of a book is the his history of a book's previous readings. Every new reader is affected by what he or she imagines the book to have been in previous hands. So with a little bit of technology, we could make that, that literally true. And, and so future books could retain echoes of the people we used to be when we first read them. Um, I've uh, mentioned that neuroscience has shown that when we read, we actually, actually become the book. But perhaps given a bit of time, future books could become us. Thank you. I'm curious about this, this notion of yours um, about becoming the thing that you're reading. Mm -hmm. I understand, I think, a little bit of the neuroscience behind it. But what do I become when I'm reading about matrix algebra? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. There's a whole category of books I don't know no, what no, no. that means. No, no, no. I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, there's, um, of course, I am mainly talking about uh, fiction here. I mean, uh, there's sort of, uh, and I think fiction has some, 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 something of a... Uh, unique ability to, to sort of get us to identify with other people and get us to feel what it's like to be them. No, no, I mean, there are obviously uh, categories of, I mean, some, some, some non-fictional uh, books with a narrative structure can do that as well. Um, but, but, but you're right, I mean, engagement with something like mathematics is, is sort of completely, completely different. Um, I guess there also, also the, the, uh, the sort of kind of slowness and, and, and sort of distraction-free nature of the experience is quite important though. So, so to have something that 
help, helps you engage with it. And, and I think even there, some sort of technology that would monitor your, your, your state of concentration could actually be, be quite helpful. My question is, with this, isn't this going to be putting a lot huger burden on the author to be able to be creating multiple paths of his story? And how much does it then start becoming maybe author by committee because you've got to have multiple people in there to do all the different uh, options? No, that's, that's, a, that's, that's an extremely good question. So, so for example, work, working on this um, Snow White uh, story, story I mentioned, initially the idea was to have it a, a lot more like choose your own adventure story. But, um, but what, what I actually started to feel like fe feel was, was that I actually had a slight problem with, with sort of multiply branching narratives. Because the thing about good fiction is that the ending of the story is very important. And that ending has, somehow, has, has to be somehow both surprising and inevitable. Uh, and that inevitability has to arise from the character and uh, all the interactions of the characters. So if you want to write stories with radically different multiple endings, you, you, some, the characters themselves have to be quite different. And, and so you do get this huge cognitive burden dealing, dealing with that and, and uh, some sort of combinatorial explosion. So, so I'm not necessarily saying that um, it, it, you, you always have to have multiple branching narratives. And, and um, it's kind of interesting what the um, uh, BBC guys, for example, have set as their goal with perceptive media, which is not necessarily have multiple conclusions or endings, but just along the way, put slightly different emphasis on different things, regard, regard, uh, sort of depending on what the sort of measured preferences or, or uh, whatever we know about the, the viewer or reader reader is. So, so I think you, you can still, th that approach might, might actually be a bit more scalable and still allow uh, some degree of authorial control, which, which of course, uh, writers guard very jealously. So uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I'm wondering, how will you be able to discuss a book, like say, come up to somebody and say, hey, I read this book, and they read a totally different thing, or if you want to write a report on it. So I, th I think any sort of discussion will be really confused. What, what's your opinion mm -hmm. on that? Um, but I mean, that might also make it a lot more interesting. I mean, if, if, if you are able to, I mean, I, mean, I think that that's e even, even now with books, I, I think people discover different things uh, than, than, other, than other readers. I mean, uh, it, it sort of really depends on how radically you allow it to, to, to change. I mean, if it's, if it's sort of, uh, if it's all generated by, by an artificial intelligence sort of ba based on some measurements that, that, that it makes, uh, 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 in the reader's brain, then, then you're right. It could be uh, completely, completely, completely different. Um, but I don't know. I mean, that should lead to richer and more, more, more interesting discussions. Um, and, and, and of course, they, the, 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 peop the, the, the two individuals in question might have the ability to, to compare their respective versions and see where they, where they diverge. I mean, a lot of these issues are being dealt with right now in, in video games. Uh -huh. uh, constructing these sort of branching narratives where you can maybe even choose the gender of your character from the beginning of the story and that has ramifications throughout the rest mm. of the mm. long arc of a video game or maybe even over multiple games. Mm. Um, especially also when you talk about things like uh, MMOs uh, and you have multiple different people interacting but you're also trying to construct a narrative in that space that's sort of mm. shared amongst all those people. So I wonder, it's not really a question, but just do you have anything to, uh, do you have any insights into that space or how this interacts with what you were talking about? No, I mean, it's, it's um, <clears throat> very, very related. And, it, and, and something, something that's sort of, um, my, 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 my third, third novel, uh, the, the Causal Angel, actually deal, deals quite a bit with games. And um, so, so, so uh, in order to, to do research for it, I actually uh, bought an Xbox and played, played Batman Arkham, uh, Arkham City quite a bit. But, uh, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I mean, it's absolutely fascinating what, what people are do, doing, doing in the context of computer games uh, and, and, and sort of uh, branching storytelling and role playing and, and so on. But I, I haven't yet quite found a way, or, or I, I don't know of uh, a, a computer game where the, the sort of narrative experience and identification with a character is as deep as it is in fiction. And I, and I wonder if it, at least using current the current sort of generation of computer games, if it can ever be. Um, in the sort of area of games, the, the, the domain where I personally had such experience in, the, in a gaming context uh, has been in sort of tabletop and live role-playing games, 
with, with st very strong narrative elements. So I'm not saying sort of convergence of these uh, two things is impossible. Um, but I was sort of, uh, for, for the purposes of this, uh, this discussion, I was really focusing on more how could we enhance this, this experience of uh, sitting down and, and reading a book. But again, very, very good point. So I was curious if um, uh, you tried using any of the emotive technology while you were uh, trying to write any of the stories as well. <laughs> so um, I kind of wonder if eventually you'd start having a profile between the author and the readers so that you can start suggesting things based off of someone with a similar pattern if there's, or if you had done anything with that already. We, we did actually uh, think about that idea. So, so um, although, although, I mean, with the current, uh, current uh, technology, the limitations are, are pretty, pretty serious. But, um, yeah, we, ha we did have this idea actually with uh, a, a, a research robotics researcher uh, in Edinburgh University that maybe we could have a, a sort of underlying a generative model of, of, of text. I mean, I guess you guys have, have sort of huge, huge uh, engrams and, and uh, things, things like that, um, that um, uh, we could use to generate text and then measure uh, the res brain response of the author in, in, in this case. Um, for example, there's a very nice um, signal uh, in the brain called P300, which sort of activates when you see something that really interests you or, or you find surprising. So you could actually maybe use this kind of signal to train a sort of a genetic algorithm to, to, to generate text that you somehow like or find, find interesting. But, but I think the, you'd have to put quite a lot of thought into the constraint, how to constrain that to, to make it interesting. There's a startup in Chile which is using a very uh, similar technique to allow uh, school children to create 3D models of monsters. So they, they're evolving sort of 3D models of monsters and, and, uh, and, and sort of steering the sort of uh, utility function of, of, the, of the algorithm based on what they measure in the, in the, in the, in the brain. So, um, but, but I mean, the current generation of devices is very noisy, so, so I, think, I think it's effectively random. But, but yeah, very, very interesting idea. I'm uh, curious if you had any ideas instead of maybe a book being more pleasurable to someone or finding out what somebody prefers, maybe writing a book that really antagonizes someone or like mm. kind of pushes them out of their comfort zone. Mm. You know, that, that, that was kind of, that was actually kind of what we were aiming for with the, um, the Snow White story. So, so, so it wasn't really necessarily about their, their, their comfort zone, but actually, actually kind of try to take, take them in directions that they wouldn't expect. So, so, so I guess then, then it really becomes like the fiction already is to 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 large extent actually i mean one wonderful example of that is is ian banks's first novel the wasp factory which is uh, a fantastic fictional experience but very 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 unpleasant um so so yeah absolutely i mean you you could equally well use these kinds of techniques for for kind of engineering a a certain emotional trajectory that or path that you want to take the the reader through and 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 there there it, it sort of becomes almost like a control problem. If, 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 you, if you sort of, you, you, and, and there, there, there is an element of authorial design. So, so if, you, if you feel that the user is kind of straying away from, from this path that you've designed, you try to push them with new content back, to, back, on, back on track with that, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you've thought of to engage the reader in some analysis of the book after the fact? So, you know, in regular books, we have discussion questions perhaps at the end. But is there some new thoughts of engaging the reader in literary analysis along the way or at the end? Hmm. I mean, uh, so, so I, I confess I'm, I'm, I'm quite ignorant of, of uh, sort of the practice and techniques of literary criticism, uh, criticism but uh, one idea we had, which we partially implemented, but it's not really in the current version, was to actually give the user a kind of a heat map of of the the story based on uh, regions where where they had been sort of uh, w w depending on which direction their reaction had swung in different parts so 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 to sort of highlight to them what parts had had been the most engaging uh, I actually did a little bit of experimentation uh, uh, my, with, with Sam on this just by reading uh, a large variety of of, um, of fiction and then sort of looking at things which engaged us they were quite different for me and me and Sam, and, and obviously different types of engagement. Um, a, a, a lot of a uh, lot of very sort of rich stylists actually we found created an awful lot of activity in the, sort of the, the back uh, um, uh, electrodes of, of of the device, which is kind of associated with the visual region. So 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 clearly we were getting a lot of lot of visual images, but uh, I'm sure there could be a much richer engagement between between sort of the uh, 
neural experience and actual and, and actually for me as an author it would be really interesting to see how to uh, what, what, what sort of uh, what sort of uh, sections of the text and style provoke reactions in readers so yeah thank you